Um, a newer bottle staff member I started in the beginning of August. Um, I have a strong debate background, debated in both high school and in college at the National League competitive level. And I'm very excited to be working with novice for the next couple of weeks until we get started with the first bottle tournament of the year because the topic of today's meeting is basically demystifying the transitions that you'll make in each division of debate so right now we're all in novice and i don't know if we all have an understanding of what that means but maybe someone can help us break down how long or what do you think that it means to be a novice if someone can let me know what they think that it means to be a novice, what and then we'll then we'll move on to the other levels. But let's just start with novice right now. Uh, I think it's just you're completely new to the um, to debate. I guess uh, I think that's really it. Yeah, you're new to debate. You either have um, debated a little bit or have maybe just gone like to a couple of practices, but novice, there's typically two different di divisions of novice, but not everywhere observes it. So there's super novice, which is when you're going to your first tournament of the year, you have zero debate experience. Maybe you've gone to practice, but you've never formally attended a debate tournament at all. You are a super novice. After that point, everything of that, after that is immediately considered novice. And like everyone has suggested, novices are considered new debaters. Um, but you don't have to stay in novice even when you're a new debater, right? So staying in novice and moving outside of novice is primarily based on two things. The first is the per your, your perceived understanding of how well you have mastered the basics of debate and then the second reason that you might move out of novice or stay in novice is based on your confidence level. It's basically novice, you know, the kind of topics, the basic understandings of things. The difference between the two are those two things that we talked about, your confidence level and your perceived mastery of the basic elements of debate. And so what are some of those basic elements of debate? Because I think that most of us understand what it means to, if you feel confident in your ability to take on a new challenge, I think most of us might understand what that means. And if not, that's not a problem. Um, raise a hand or drop a question in the chat bar and I will definitely address it and let you know what that could look like to help you determine if you think that you are ready for more of a challenge or if you think that you would like a little bit more time exploring um, the novice division with Sakai. So what are the basic elements of debate? Do you feel comfortable speaking in front of other people? Is the biggest question that I like to ask people when they are moving between divisions. The more that you move around, the larger the stakes are for you in debate. And typically what that means is that there will be more people who are watching you. Not always. It doesn't mean that you'll have 20 people in your round or um, three coaches who are scouting you and watching you in that debate, but you might have more people who are in there participating to see what you're doing in order to, you know, assess competition or to just learn. And that's more typical in the open division, which is considered, which is where JV and varsity both live. Um, so today I want everybody to take a couple minutes to think of two questions that you have that you think need to be answered before you are ready to move to junior varsity from novice. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna come back as a group. I'm gonna type all of those uh, questions that everyone has come up with into a Google doc. And then I'm going to answer all of those questions with you all today. I will share this Google doc with you. And I wanted to hear what folks thoughts and considerations are about when they will be ready to move into JV or varsity. Um, 
or what do they think that they need to be getting in novice to feel more prepared as a debater? So take a couple minutes and then we'll come back. Now that we're back, we're going to get started with these first couple of questions, and then we'll move on to the second set of questions that I have after we take a break from these questions. So we'll just run through these first, and then we'll take that break. All right. So someone said, if I feel unprepared for the first or upcoming tournament, am I still required to go? No. Baldo does not make you go to any tournament that you do not want to go to, but the benefit of going to the tournament if you feel unprepared is that everybody feels unprepared at the first in the up first couple of tournaments. You know, you're getting to learn the topic, you're getting back into the swing of speaking in front of people, you're getting back into speed reading or learning how to speed read for the first time. There is so much that everybody is all worried about for the first couple of tournaments that you would not be alone in feeling unprepared. So here's the thing about debate. So a little bit, I did debate all four years of high school, first two years of college. Uh, it's something that takes getting used to. So if at the first couple of tournaments, you're like, this is weird, this is awkward, I'm not sure what I'm doing, you're doing it right, I promise you. Uh, it's something that you're going to have to do until it kind of clicks and makes sense. And I promise there's a moment where you're like, oh, I get it. And it becomes much, much simpler from there. But the reason that we do these things is to try to help get you there quicker and get those first tournaments to where you get over those nerves and stuff like that. So expect to be a little awkward about it, especially since this is the first year any of us are doing it online, but it's going to be fine the longer you do it. Hey, Brooke, you back? Yeah, thanks for that. So the second question is, I'm still confused. How does the teammate thing work? How would the teammate thing translate into the debate setting? Could you elaborate on how we're going to utilize our teammates? All right, so this question can mean a couple of different things. So you have two different types of teammates. You have people who are um, not in the particular debate with you, who are a part of the debate team at your school but you also have people who are your teammates, who are your par debate partners. Because debate is a two-person activity. Your immediate um, teammate is the one, or the, the person who is immediately with you in the debate rounds is considered your partner. And they're also your teammate. So in the debate round, one of you is the first constructive speaker and the other person is a second constructive speaker. And the difference between those positions is one of those people speaks first and hint, it's a person with the uh, first in their name. So if you're the first affirmative constructive or the second negative constructive speaker, then you will be speaking first for your side um, in that particular debate round. Um, some important things to know also about that kind of teammate team partnership is that Typically, the person who is a second constructive speaker is the person who is given more reign over the decisions that you make in that particular debate. Now, this kind of looks like being the, the person who makes the big decisions for the arguments that you go for. So for example, if we are defending the abolished ICE affirmative and I'm the second, affir uh, second affirmative constructive speaker, if um, I think that we need to be going for a permutation in the final affirmative constructive speech, then I would need my first, the first affirmative rebuttal speech to be continuing the permutation that I make earlier in the debate. Even if the first affirmative speaker thinks, I don't know if that's a good idea, typically the rule is that the second of the second person um, it has more of the control over the decisions that you'll make for that debate. So hopefully that clarifies what you what you meant when you asked that question about teammates. And if it doesn't, ask a follow up question in the chat, and I'll just put that in our second round. Um, Harrison, I don't know if you wanted to add in on that question at all. Uh, yeah, I mean, 
the strength of having the partner is that you're not doing it alone. You have somebody to collaborate with. And then also in the debate round when you have prep time, because each team has, I think, eight minutes of prep, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so each team has eight minutes of prep. So when you decide, like, I'm going to take two minutes to prepare for my speech, you have another person to help you, like, pick cards and write arguments and stuff like that. So in addition to, like, strict speaking order, you can collaborate during prep time together. But okay, so the next question was, how can you arrange arguments from the packet quickly? And how do you also take notes quickly? So the import, I'll start off with taking the notes quickly, because I think that you're, what you're talking about is what we refer to in debate as flowing. So flowing is the practice of writing down the words that people say in their speeches in as verbatim shorthand as possible. So what does that mean, right? What is verbatim shorthand? Verbatim means to write, to um, copy either by speaking it or writing it in this particular instance, because we're, when someone's speaking, we're not speaking to, we're writing it down. Verbatim would mean we're trying to write down as much as what they have said exactly as they have said it. This is a useful skill um, just because you want to make sure that you use the language of your opponent as well as the language of your partner so that you're showing that you are talking about the right things. Because sometimes you'll be talking about things that are um, the same as what a, your teammate or the opposite team is talking about. But when you use vastly different phrases or words from the original topic, your judge might be confused. So a way that you want to practice in your note taking and your note taking quickly is finding ways to shorten words through like, think of it like text messaging. You know, like people don't really as much use some of the old school texting, um, text spellings that they used to like, but we still use some of them. For example, like if you want to say, I, I love you or I miss you to someone, but you don't miss them that tough, you know, you probably would, would write them I-M-Y or I-L-Y. And what you want to do to be able to create a good note-taking system in debate is create different word banks for yourself to be able to create like a similar uh, text format or shorthand of the words that your opponent and your teammate is using. Does that make sense? Does anybody have any questions about that particular part? Because that's just the one part of the question about flowing. All right. Um, so someone asked, how fast do you need to speak? Now, this is something that people talk about a lot in debate. Do you need to be super fast? Do you need to be medium fast? Do you need to be only sort of fast? Or do you need to be regular conversation pace? So there is no one size fits all an answer for any debate round or for any debater. Um, the best of debaters know when to utilize speed to their advantage and when to utilize slowing down to their advantage. Uh, but I do want to stress that as you're in your earliest stages of debate and getting just like invested in the activity, it is completely normal. It is not strange and you are not behind if you are not as fast as some other folks that you know um, either in the league or at your school who have deba done debate for longer than you. It takes a little bit of time and a lot of training to be able to teach our mouths to be able to speak clearly and um, to speak clearly, loudly, and effectively at the rate of some of the best of policy debaters. And so you do not have to go fast. You do not have to go slow. You can speak at whatever rate is appropriate for you. The caveat or the kind of, um, all, the, kind of, the only thing that I would encourage you to think about when you're determining how fast or how slow you should go in a particular debate is making sure that you answer the substance of the arguments of your opponent. You can, you can answer someone who went super fast um, in their speech arguments by figuring out what are the major points that I need to win from that last speech that they uh, were talking about. Because oftentimes folks who are talking super fast are doing that to try to trump up 
as with a, the, the debate with as many pieces of physical evidence or cards as possible. But ultimately, those cards, those evidence, and those arguments are often saying the exact same thing. If not the exact same thing, they're making similar arguments that can be subsumed under one thing that you say pretty slowly. <laughs> and that's just about um, you know remaining calm in those debates and knowing that you don't have to answer everything that they say in a one-to-one -one kind of ratio if you are resolving what they're talking about in more than one sentence or a couple of different pieces of evidence, you can do that at your own pace if you feel like that is sufficient. Um, and I think I just got a clarification. Uh, yeah, I meant that the opponent's argument specifically, how do you quickly arrange specific arguments? So if I can if 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 I can add on to that a little bit more because I think that 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 help that help um that help me with your question about what you're asking me for so to answer an ar arguments quickly the biggest I would say the biggest thing that you would need to be able to do is learn your affirmative as best as you can you will not be able to learn all of their arguments, you will not always have a block or even evidence to be able to respond to the vast majority of your opponent's arguments that you will encounter in this school year and whatever next school years if you continue on in debate. That's just the name of the game is that you have to be com that you'll get more comfortable with knowing that you will have to depend on your mind and your critical thinking to answer certain things that you don't have a pre-written response for. And so I say that it's important for you to know your affirmative because you wanna be able to look at what they're claiming of you, specifically like I'm, I'm speaking as if you're affirmative and you're debating a, a one and C that is a little bit confusing to you. So they are reading maybe three off case arguments and they have some case arguments and you don't have any physical cards or you don't have many uh, to respond to all of their speech. So how would you go about creating your 2AC quickly um, so that you're making the most use of your time? Um, you're able to make the most use of your time when, you're, when you can go through that one and see and determine if those links, if those case arguments are correct in response to the app. Not everything that people will read against you is relevant. So if your app is saying the sky is blue, if they read a, a disad or a counter plan or whatever off case argument against you, and they say that the sky is uh, gray and that's bad and you, uh, in the or like if they say that the sky is gray and that's a good thing but the passing the plan makes it blue that wouldn't apply to your app because if you said that the sky is yellow them talking about the sky being blue is not anything related to what you're saying hopefully that makes sense <laughs> you have to be able to know basically when a team are is using evidence or making arguments against you that are incorrect and you do that by knowing the language of your cards, about the art, all of the arguments that are in the, the unhighlighted, the ununderlined portions of your evidence, so that you can make informed commentary against what your opponents are saying. Um, how confident do you need to be in your knowledge of debate topics in debating in general to and I'm going to I'm just make sure that we all know that this is about specifically, you know, novice to JV, but it could also apply for JV to varsity or for novice to varsity. Like I said at the very beginning of this conversation, you don't have to go directly to junior varsity if you feel like you are ready for even more challenge. You can go directly to varsity. But you can feel confident in your knowledge on debate. I'll start with debate and then I'll talk about the debate topic 
Um, so let's just start with debate. I would say feeling confident in debate takes a couple of things. First is getting used to speaking in front of people. And there's a lot of ways you can do that. Um, you could start by going live on Instagram. You know, if you have like, a, you know, a bunch of friends and stuff and you've never gone live on Instagram or Facebook or whatever else you can go live on these days, use that as an opportunity to practice talking to other people. Mostly because I wouldn't typically advocate for this just because it's a different, like it can be a different arena, but choose a topic that's either like relevant to your group of friends or about something related to the debate resolution of criminal justice reform in practice, giving a comp, like a speech out where other people will be listening to you. Because the name of the game in this communication activity is about your comfort in trying to speak to, to hear, and to engage other people in communication. So confidence, is typically built from having a good understanding of how to do the thing. And the big, biggest thing that you do in debate is talk. So the more that you are doing talking intentionally, and that can look like speaking drills by yourself, it could look like practicing your 1AC or your 1NC in front of a, a bottle staff member or a coach from your school. Or if you don't have a coach from your school, maybe like a, a teacher, who you care about and thinks might be interested in, in helping you work on your debate skills. It could be you giving a speech to your partner and they give a speech to you. But the biggest thing that will, it will, that will impact your confidence in debating in general is your ability to get started speaking. Um, because the other kind of parts of debate, like learning the rules, learning the, um, you know, stock stock issues, learning about critiques and counterplans and dissets, all of those kinds of things are, are useful and they can come over time and we want to get them as early as possible. But all of those things are only helpful if we can get you comfortable with speaking. And so for, for getting confident on the, the resolution aspect of the topic, um, I would encourage you to do a couple of different things. The first, and, and this is one that seems to me to be really, um, it was always my obvious way to approach understanding and building confidence in the resolution, but I recognize not everybody had the same foundation that I had in debate. And so what I like to do to feel, to learn or to build my confidence up about the resolution is I like to make the resolution into the form of a question. Um, they used to already be in question form, like way back in the day of debate. It used to be like resolved, should the United States federal government do X, Y, Z thing. Now we typically get a generic sentence. So like, for example, this year, the topic is the United States federal government should enact a substantial criminal justice reform in one of the more of the following areas, forensic science, policing, and sentencing. I would make that into a question, which is pretty simple. It, it doesn't require too much work. Just adding really that should question into that statement that is the resolution. Should the United States enact criminal justice reform? So I would answer that question first. And I would, I would look up reasons as to why I feel the way that I do. Do I think that the federal government should enact criminal justice reform generally? Should I, do I think that this is something that is important? I'd learn about what the criminal, what makes up the criminal justice system. Um, what has reform looked like in the past? Uh, what are new examples of reform that might be on the horizon for politics in the criminal justice system? And then after I, I kind of answered, if I think that criminal, criminal justice reform generally should be reformed, then I would go into those three areas that the resolution covers, forensic science, policing, and um, sentencing. 
So this is one of the assignments that we actually have done in JV. And if you are listening to me just explain how you build your confidence in the resolution, you could be over here in JV getting, getting down with us, getting ready to you know attack the topic because we want to build your confidence. JV is really for novice, is for students who are newer to debate, who, are, who have been working on their confidence and are ready for a challenge. It's not the same levels of varsity, we're doing the things that build your confidence to ultimately get you ready for the varsity division of debate. And so we do things like answer the resolution to help inform you about the topic before you ever enter into the physical debate round. So to just kind of summarize this point, because I know I kind of went a little bit back and forth, so I wanna make sure that everybody is still with me. Um, how you build your confidence in the resolution is by getting started with answering the resolution for yourself and finding warranted or evidence that supports why you think the resolution is, uh, should or should not be affirmed. Um, and I don't know, I, I, I kind of forgot that Harrison was on the call. Harrison, I don't know if you wanted to add anything at any point. If you want to add anything, definitely please jump in. I've just been shooting through these, trying to make sure that we get all of them, but definitely feel free to add in whenever you got some. Sure, you got it. All right. Um, next question that we got was, how does cross-sex work? Uh, so cross-sex is pretty simple. It's actually one of the, the, the chillest times in the debate round outside of prep time. So in between the constructive speeches, and there's four of those, there's four constructive speeches. After each one of them, there is a three minute cross-examination period. Cross-ex is used for the purpose of asking your opponent who has just given the speech questions that clarify the content, or you ask them questions that are for the purposes of understanding their argument to build your strategy. So those two are important, right? Because they're different. One is just for basic comprehension. You need to know which kind of questions that you're asking so that like, you know, you can pay attention to how they're responding to get the answers that you actually want. Because sometimes, you will be debating against someone and you're in cross-sex and you're asking them questions and they're, they're focused so much on strategy that they will not give you a clear explanation that you need just to basically understand what their argument is. In those moments, you should stop asking different versions of the question that you've been asking them um, and just move on. Because <laughs> at some point, uh, you, you, you have to recognize that if you can't get what you need from them in cross-sex for either the comprehension purposes or for you to be able to build your strategy, you have to know when, it, when to be able to move on because you only have three minutes. And so you need to ask as many questions that are needed, not as many questions that are possible. You don't need to have 10 questions for cross-sex. You don't need to have five questions for cross-sex. You don't need to have seven questions for cross-sex. There is not a set number of questions that you need to have prepared to ask for cross-sex. You just need to be able to ask questions that benefit you in either your comprehension of their arguments or in uh, solidifying your strategy against the arguments that they uh, have just been speaking about. And if you, again, if you ever have any questions at when, I'm, when I'm giving these explanations, please let me know. Um, it is important to me that everyone walks away from this conversation feeling like you have a deeper understanding of not just debate in general, but what you need to do personally to be able to move up to the next level and um, in terms of debate. So, Someone asked, is it okay to join SLC after I get more adjusted to the basics of the debate? Yes, we want you over here in SLC. SLC is not just for people who have been in debate for like three or four years or whatever. SLC is for students who have um, at least debated in the junior varsity division for 
one tournament really. Because originally we had SOC kind of opened up to anybody of which would include novice, excuse me, which included novice folks. But we recognized that we came into some issues with moving through some of the content that we had created just because not everybody was able to move at the same pace. And that's not a problem. Um, so once you get some of these basic parts of debate, which I don't think is truly just, um, you know, the stock issues, speech times, and all those things are important. I think I would say the most basic thing that you should ask before you move up to JV, before you, uh, you know, consider then Student Leadership Council is, are you okay? And I've said this a couple of times, you might get tired of hearing me say it, but are you okay with speaking in front of other people? That's the biggest question. Once you feel like you're pretty good about that, we can do a lot with you over in JV and we can do a lot with you over in SLC. But if you feel like you're interested in going to national tournament, SLC sounds in pretty exciting to you, start in JV because I'll give, be giving you the tools that you need in order to be able to debate, not just at uh, the, you know, bottle tournaments, but to really give you the tools that you need to become nationally competitive. Okay, so someone said, how do I feel confident enough to go solo in a debate round? To clarify, you, you won't be doing every position, right? As we kind of went over, you have a debate partner. Debate is a two-person team. Every now and again, if someone got sick during the tournament, you may be by yourself, and then you would have to debate Maverick. But that is a strange and not usual circumstance that you would not be coming into a tournament, with the exception of bottle tournaments, where you are allowed to debate as a single-person debater. Um, in policy debate. Um, so you don't have to worry about doing all the speeches. So that should take away some of the fear because in each debate, you're only given two speeches. Out of all the speeches that are happening in the time frame from the beginning of the debate to the end of the debate, you are only doing two speeches and you are doing one cross X. One. <laughs> um, I had so a question about cross X. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, so is it mostly about asking questions that will clarify like about their argument or is it more to ask questions that like kind of poke holes in their argument? So it is both, but I would say that the first question that you had precedes the other. So to be able to make questions that um, create holes or allow, because so you have to understand the purpose of the poking holes too. You don't necessarily want them to know all the holes that you're going to poke in your speech that gives them an opportunity to prepare, you know, their, their, their partner can start writing up preempts or responses to what they think that you are going for based off your line of questioning. Like, you know, for example, if you, if you want your, your, your mom to take you to Dairy Queen, you might want to make it a little bit more obscure than, hey, mom, you know, sounds like it's a, it feels like it's a Dairy Queen kind of day, if that's not typically how your mom would make a, you know, take you on a Dairy Queen run. Maybe you need to sweeten the deal for her a little bit and make it so that you get to the answer that you want, which is that you get to Dairy Queen. But if she doesn't want to go to Dairy Queen, you might want to change how you get her to that answer because you want her to agree with you or something like that. So if you know that your mom might tell you, hey, you've had Dairy Queen for the last three days. I ain't taking you to, to Dairy Queen. Then you'll want to poke some holes in her argument, right? But you wouldn't want her to know immediately that your goal in this conversation is to get her to take you to Dairy Queen. That's like what you're doing in cross -ex. You want them to um, give you as much as you need to understand their argument to then be able to poke subtle holes into their arguments that are most clear to the judge. Does that help? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, no worries. 
Um, and yeah, this is just to reiterate in case folks might have forgot or whatever. If you have questions anytime while you, while I am speaking, please do feel free to ask that question as Kennedy just did. Um, okay. Am, do you have to be perfect at debating? There is no perfect at debating. <laughs> And I know that that is hard to receive when you see like some of the uh, best of the best from, you know, schools that have had teams for a while and have a whole suite of coaches, maybe, or just you see a debater who you think is really, you know, killing the game. It's hard not to want to compare yourself to them, but you should. not And I'm going to give you a quick little plug as to why you should not is that everybody had to start at novice <laughs> and novice does not look like JV just because you're a good speaker, just because people have told you you can argue, just because somebody told you debate might be good for you. All of those are not going to mean you're gonna be right at what you consider yourself to be of a perfect version of yourself as a debater. And honestly, the goal is never to become perfect the goal is to always be able to grow. There's always has to be room for improvement in order to see some of the top levels of debating. The people who get stuck and stay towards the middle or lean towards the bottom or have caps in how high they can go are the people who typically believe themselves to be at the top of their game. <laughs> and that makes it harder for you to receive coaching. It makes it harder for... Um, you to, to be able to receive criticism from judges that will give you more insight to improve your arguments uh, based on clarity or just the, like the literally how well you were speaking or um, the, the actual choice of words that you use in debate. All of those things um, over time help inform you to continue to make you a better debater. And the feedback that you'll get while you're a novice uh, will be different from the feedback that you get while you're in JV will be different from the feedback that you'll get while you're in varsity, but all of which are important and all of which will continue to happen over every stage of your career. And because nobody in this world is perfect, shout out to Hannah Montana if anybody's familiar with that song, <laughs> you should just know that comments will always be coming from every different direction and you have to kind of get yourself used to the idea that being imperfect is okay. Um, that's a hard one. That's one that I had to learn um, a lot in college. It's like, well, shouldn't I, because I've been doing debates since I was 13, shouldn't I be the best of the best? You know, shouldn't that be where I'm at? Shouldn't you understand where I've been? You know, <laughs> whatever, wrong. Everybody makes mistakes. Some of the best, some of the brightest will forget to start their timer and then completely mess up their speech, you know, or your Word document closed out until you have to go off the fly, you know, like everything and anything can happen. And that's okay. We make better decisions the next time around. If you can look at the mistakes that you make over time, for example, if your timer doesn't start, or if your Word document closed out, what can I do the next time around to be able to prevent this from being a hindrance for me from getting that W? You know, it gives you an opportunity to plan for success in the future, even if you did not attain that success in that particular debate round. So throw out that idea of being a perfect debater or having, you know, all the perfect skills to be the best debater. Because that person doesn't exist and that person is not you, that person's not me, that person's not any of us. Um, and that's not where we should strive to be anyways. We should, you know, celebrate ourselves at all stages of this. Last question, and then I'll, I'll give us a, a break because we'll, we'll be out here, we will be out of here in about 28 minutes. So um, the last question that we got, and we'll take, a, we'll take a five minute break and we'll come back and finish out these questions is how much time needs to be put into debate? Awesome question, whoever asks this. How much time you put into debate is 
up to you. <laughs> we can't tell you that you need to be at every weekly bottle practice, that you need to be at every, um, your high school debate practice, that you need to put in 13 hours of research for the week. Uh, we, we, don't, we, don't, we don't recommend that anyone set a specific time limit for um, where you are in, in terms of putting the time into debate. And time can be a lot of different things. So I want us to diversify what we think of as investing energy into growing as a public speaker. So it helps to not just think of like some of the things that I'm gonna list out to do as being specific just to debate because the point of debate is to ultimately make you a good speaker, a good advocate for things. And so a way that you can help put time into becoming in a, a better advocate and becoming a better speaker, which is remember the overall goal of why we do debate, um, is finding ways to engage speaking um, in the art of argumentation in our day-to-day -day lives. So if you're a person who find yourself unable to do some of the uh, training that you see your peers doing, for example, this might look like watching a uh, college debate rounds. You know, you're watching the uh, Northwestern versus Harvard and you're thinking like, and, and, or someone's watching Northwestern versus Harvard and they come to um, your coach and they're like, yeah, I have some questions about this debate round that I was watching and I want to do so something like so-and-so. And you hear this and you're like, whoa, I just highlighted my 1AC and that's all I've been doing, <laughs> you know, like, and you're over here watching college policy debate rounds, like college, you can understand that they're talking even faster than us, you know? The biggest thing that can hold you back in debate is comparing yourself to others. <laughs> what you are doing for you can change, but it should not change because you think you are doing, um, you need to be doing what someone else is doing. You can do more with new information. For example, if you hear from this debater that uh, watching college policy debate rounds, and this maybe this specific policy debate round helped them to understand um, the capitalism critique better, then you might want to do that. But you shouldn't just do something because you think that someone is doing that and getting ahead um, for a reason that might not be helpful to you. So if you wanna take someone's idea about how they are investing time or they are investing their energy into preparing for debate, you should have a reason as to how doing what they have done will help you. But I think that the best way to determine for yourself how much energy or how much time you need to put into debate, you will do a couple of different things. The first is determine how much free time do you have? And I mean, when that, that from the time that you get up in the morning to the time that you go to bed seven days a week, how much free time do you have in each of those seven days? Because what you may do devote towards debate on Monday may not look like what you can devote to debate on Saturday, which may look different from what you can devote, devote to debate on Wednesdays. And that's not a problem. If you aren't able to attend your school practices or bottle practices consistently, for example, we've had students who've had to sign off in the middle of this conversation. If you could figure out another point in time to be able to add in what you think will be useful for you to get better at debate. For example, if that, if like uh, Jan had to leave, leave this call and Enzo had to leave this call, if these questions have been informative to them, or how I've been answering these questions have been informative, then they would watch the recordings of this at their leisure at another point throughout the week based off of where they see that they have pockets of time in each of the seven days of their week um, to be able to fit in working on debate. Um, and so based on your lifestyle and how much time, free time you have, 
I would determine what is my weekly goal for working on debate. And then after I determined how much time that I want to spend working on debate based off of how much free time that I have overall, <laughs> I would then ask myself, what are the things that I want to accomplish with the time that I devote towards debate? So I'm gonna, just because I'm kind of talking right now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quickly jot down what I just said because I want you all to be able to have that. So identify how much free time you have during the week based off of how much free time you have how much are you willing to commit of that time to debate every week. And then in the time that you devote to debate every week, what do you want to accomplish every week? The only way that this will be useful for you, these three points, is if you set realistic measures for success. If you know that you work an after-school job, you're in 99 debate, uh, 99 after-school clubs. You know you you got a you got an online checkers game competition coming up. You know, like if you got a lot of different things that are going on. You should be very, very brutally honest about how much free time that you have. Because remember, this will affect probably things like your confidence or your uh, confidence in debate and your knowledge of the topic. So you might need to stay a novice for longer depending on the amount of time that you think that you have to com commit yourself to becoming either more confident or more competent in debate. Um, but if you have, uh, like, let's say you have 10 hours free every week in total, you probably won't want to use the full 10 hours to devote to debate because that's all your free time. That's all your Instagram time. That's all your going to tropical cafe, smoothie, free time. You know, you would want to use a portion of that time that you think is appropriate to debate. So if I have 10 hours to to designate every week, I'm gonna use, I'm gonna commit myself to three of those hours going towards debate. That's 30% of my time that is free, i.e. I don't have any other responsibilities that I'm going to yield towards debate. And because of that, I need to make goals that are realistic for me to accomplish in three hours a week, you know? Because it may not be that you do the, 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 you put in your work for debate in three hours consecutively. You might do an hour on Monday, you might do an hour on Wednesday, you might do an hour on Friday. You know, you, you will split that up however works for your particular schedule. But you would use those three hours to accomplish whatever goals you have for that week. So if I'm a novice and I have three hours that I'm dedicating per week, I would set a goal like practice or um, practice flowing a full debate round. And I would look up uh, a debate that I think that I would be able to flow and I would, you know, ask for tips on how to, like I would ask a bottle staff member or some of my peers, uh, what are ways that I can work on my flowing? What do you think that a flow needs to have? And then I would watch that debate <laughs> and I would practice flowing. And then I would be done for that week for what I asked myself to accomplish in those three hours. If I you know, did everything that I asked myself to do, which is to practice my flowing, of a full debate round. So set your goals in a way that is realistic and that actually still can push you 
further towards your overall goal. Because what we want you to be doing is not just staying in novice because you're scared. And that's what we're worried about. We want you to be a novice because that is what works for your schedule. You don't have that much time to put into debate. Um, and so you are only able to perhaps to attend these weekly Wednesday meetings. You can't go to other practices to be exposed to more things. Maybe you won't be able to go to most of the tournaments this semester. Um, our reasons why one would stay a novice for um, a couple of weeks to months at a time. But ultimately, if you have time to spare that you have been devoting towards becoming better in debate, we want you to be setting goals and accomplishments that will move you towards going to that higher division. So let's go ahead and take a, let's take a, a seven minute break and we'll come back at, uh, we'll come back at 520 and then we'll, we'll close out uh, with, uh, I'll look through these questions and I'll, I'll find a final question and then I'll let everybody go for today. But I will include all the questions that we talked about today in this Google Docs with a probably two to three sentence summary of the things that we talked about today for everybody to kind of look back on. So think of it as like a, not quite a frequently asked questions kind of ordeal, but just as the questions asked about the process. Document for you to look back on, chew on, sit with, and ask any additional questions as you may need. So go ahead and take those couple of minutes and then we'll come back and we'll close out. question that we'll, we'll go to today is uh, what happens if I speak too fast or if I stumble on my words? Will points be marked off? So here's the thing. Re regardless of if you're speaking fast, if you're speaking sort of fast, if you're speaking kind of fast, if you're speaking kind of slow or very slow, um, you might get points knocked off uh, and by point, I mean speaker points, and hopefully everybody understands what that is at this point. If you don't, speaker points are the uh, points that are given to individual debaters. So if maybe so, if if Harrison was my debate partner, uh, and we were in a debate against Kennedy and Ray Lee, uh, and they were AF, we would all be getting individual speaker points on a thirty-point scale like um, meaning up to 30 points on where the judge believes we rank in terms of being a good speaker. And now one thing I want you to know is that people take off points for things that are not just because if someone is a good speaker, if they've done well in the debate round, they can take off points or they can give points for reasons that we don't know, that are just completely outside of what you would be able to build into how well you can you um, you are as a debater. And so, just as we were talking about with the one of the uh, previous questions at, before we took the break, of you know someone asked about being a perfect debater, is that the best of the best? The people who have won championships, the people who are in junior varsity and the people who are in varsity, all of those people have messed up. You have stumbled over your words. You've pronounced something incorrectly. For example, like I remember like uh, back in back in my early days, I, I remember saying like uh, hegemony for hegemony. And then like, at, you know, you keep saying it and eventually somebody's like, hey, it's not right. <laughs> But it's a growing moment. And it doesn't mean that I got marked down to the point where it affected me. Um, but some people are more sticklers about uh, you know, repeated offenses. But typically people will mark you down um, for stumbling a lot, like if you stumble like a lot, a lot. Like if you for like if you um if it seems as if you are unprepared to do the speech. That is mostly when someone might mark you down. 
but it's if it seemed as if you were prepared for the speech, but you just had a moment where you got tripped up, you probably wouldn't get marked down for that. Um, but you don't really know just because when a judges is making the speaker points, they typically do it at the end of the debate. And so they're kind of just like eyeballing it, right? Like they're kind of just like, ah, I thought that one was good. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> you got a 29 um, or I thought this one was like, uh, you could have used some work. And so you shouldn't put too much into what the speaker points are. You should really put it into just trying to do your best in that debate and the results you will, you will see. So that's the last question that we're going to go over for, for practice today. But all of the questions, and there's only about four more questions that I think that we didn't get a chance to get into, but I'll have answers to those that, and I'll get you um, the summary of, of the answers in this Word document by Friday, by Friday. Yeah, I can do that by Friday, by Friday. <laughs> and if you haven't already, please be sure to send me an email. Uh, so that I can know uh, who to be sending this to. Um, but you don't have to, if you, if you didn't already send me that email, don't worry, because you have an assignment in which you'll have to email something to me. So jot down my email while you got a second. Your assignment. Then we are done with our novice meeting for today. And thank you everybody for staying on, staying engaged, asking these great questions, because I know that sometimes when you're nervous about asking something, you might not wanna ask it, but all these questions help clarify things for the whole group. So we are done for today. Once you have my email, um, just shoot me a response uh, with your answers to these questions and I'll be able to send out this doc to you. Thank you, have a good one.